everyone to the SPA webinar today. We're really excited to be able to share with you the MLA ship projections and our star and guest today, Stephen Bicknell, MLA Marketing Information Manager, is going to kick off with a bit of a presentation and update on the figures. And then our SPA CEO, Stephen Crisp, is going to lead some questions and discussion. We'd love to get you involved. So have a great webinar. And thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks for having us, uh, Melissa, and SPA more broadly. Um, also in the room, I've got Stuart Bull and Ripley Atkinson, who are our market information analysts, who also um, played a part in producing the sheet projections 2021. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to present today. It's interesting um, being on the other side of the fence, um, you have coming from New South Wales farmers before my time at MLA. Um, so there's a lot of familiar faces in the room. So, um, just a bit about me, and, and I'm aware that this um, presentation is is being recorded and, and can be shared. So, I just thought I would share start off by sharing um, our contact details in case anyone does want to follow up with any further questions. Um, a bit about myself: I am from a sheep and wool um, farm in Western Australia. So, while working at MLA. Um, in the market information team for Easter going back to the farm um, and we're actually going to be shearing so I think I'll be doing a bit of mustering and um, a bit of rouse about it but um, for perspective all, all um, three of the team at uh, market information team do live and breathe ag. Um, Ripley is from Tamworth and Stu from a farm in Naranja so we do live and breathe um, everything we do in the projections. Thought we'd start the presentation by kicking off um, with the assumptions that underpin the model because um, a lot of the inputs that go into the model we don't necessarily have control over um, and they're assumptions that we rely on. So um, we are aware that some of the assumptions with weather say may change throughout the year and that is why we do update the um, projections three times a year. For the 2021 um, projections, there was a La Nina expected in, uh, for Northern Australia, so wetter uh, January to March for most of Queensland, uh, which was also going to bring increased rainfall to New South Wales and Victoria in that um, period from January to March. And in May to, March to May, it's around average in, in sort of um, SA, Victoria and New South Wales. So with that, we are, were predicting the sort of the second year of, of average to above average rainfall throughout Australia. And this was compounded by the fact that we um, were made aware by Bond that, that the negative um, IODs is expected, which again, we, will likely, the years that we historically where we've had a negative IOD and um, a La Nina have been some of our wettest. So that under, was a key um, theme and a key assumption that underpinned the model. Um, the other one, and sorry, Melissa, I, can you, are you guys seeing the sidebar? Um, We're seeing you beside the screen is my view, yes. Oh, good. I'll if anyone is, right. if anyone is not seeing the slides, top right, you'll have a view button. And you, if you're seeing lots of people, you're currently looking at the gallery view. You want to look at the speaker view or the standard view if you're not currently seeing the slides. Thanks for that, Melissa. One of the other key um, uh, charts that we look at is the exchange rate. And with the exchange rate, it was expected to range between 75 and 80 cents by the big banks. We don't make a, um, we don't make a, um, we don't make a forecast on uh, the exchange rate, but it does feed into our model that we have. And we have seen that this year it's already nearly got up to 80, but now it's settled back around um, it's sort of come back to around 77, 76. Um, so it is in the band that it was at the start of the year, but uh, that is where the exchange rate was going. And, and that's obviously a key thing being um, in the export market and so export focused. One of the other key assumptions uh, we, is that the IMF uh, economic outlook for um, global, global economic outlook for GDP, uh, they were predicting that a 5.2% global growth for the um, year on year change in GDP, they revised that down 
to 4.8 in October. But um, what we're seeing with that, we are expecting the key export de destinations and Australia domestically will see a GDP um, growth. And what we're like, that's likely to see is a bit more in demand in export markets, um, hopefully a little bit of um, a rising income in that lost income national income and also a trend towards a more um, food service where a lot of our product ends up overseas. One of the key um, assumptions and it was new this year was the EMI and where the EMI was going to go. Um, as we can see, it sort of has dropped from those highs, uh, those record highs in sort of 2018, 2019. With the EMI, um, ABARES had actually quite low in their uh, outlook going forward for the next five years. One of the reasons we have the AMI in, uh, EMI in there is that we, to see that impact on the um, composition of the flock from meat to sheep breeds and the likes. Um, so, so that's one of the key things that we're, we're monitoring in there. Also mindful of what cross bread wool is doing, but they underpin the model. So I suppose, um, the key thing there is there the uh, assumptions that we wrote that this document was collated on in January. One thing uh, I'll note now is that it is being um, updated and a new one will be released in June um, this year and then another one in October. Some of those assumptions, if they've changed by them regarding rainfall, exchange rate and the likes, so that will all flow in through updated numbers in June because we are aware that, um, yeah, things change and we'll always have to um, update the, the, the model throughout the year. Some of the key sort of three takeaways from the projections that we have is that we have the flock growing 5% this year um, to 67.3 million head. We also have um, lamb slaughter to grow, which, are, we, we, which is an interesting thing, um, saying that we're in, in a rebuild yet lamb slaughter is going to grow, but that's on the back of really significant improvements in marking rates that will allow producers to both retain more lambs, but all because the um, mark, because the lamb cohort will be so big, it will allow producers to retain lambs, but also sell the excess. Um, and we also have lamb production trending upwards in the next few years. This is just a, um, a outlook. Oh, this is sort of all the numbers in the table that are in the back of the projections. And that sort of shows it. And one of the things there you will definitely see is that we have got the herd breaking um, 70 million in 2022, where it sort of sat in 2028 in 2018 and then increased in 2023. That is on the base of our statistical modeling that um, following, La, following La Nina's there was historically um, two years of, of good rain. One thing we are, are aware that the climate is, is changing and in 2016 to 2018 was two years and we went from extreme wet to extreme dry, but that is the basis for that sort of 17% um, upswing between 2020 and 2023 in the, um, in the sheep uh, numbers. So that is based on average to above average years, uh, 2021 through to 2023. You'll see um, we've got slaw sheep slaughter uh, going up in 26% uh, from 2020 through to 20. Uh, 23. That is in 2023. The, the big jump there is as the rebuild really matures, and the lambs mature, and we sort of uh, reach that maturity or plateau point in the rebuild. Um, and we also have sh sort of lamb production, uh, lamb slow slaughter in 2023, hitting the levels it was around in, in 2015, 2016. So so getting back online after the rebuild. One of the things we've got is carcass weights, and we do get this, I'll, I'll explain this further later, is we do expect it to plateau um, and, and, sh um, and sheep carcass weights to plateau um, as, we, as we move forward for a, for a range of factors. You'll see that there. Um, with the production, the interesting thing we're seeing is we are expecting that um, production will increase uh, because of, if, especially for lamb, with the increase in slaughter and then increase in carcass weights we are expecting for this year, that'll allow um, production to increase. 
with the sheep exports, we will be revising that in the June one down. Um, based on the, the figures from January have just changed then from then through to now. Um, and exports, it, it, it's it's quite a good it's quite a good picture for exports that, 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 that increased production is likely to flow through into increased exports. Uh, you'll see the sort of increase in mutton and lamb um, production is flowing through to increased exports as we expect that domestic consumption to sit, sit, sit around the same and, and what we're um, producing to, to flow offshore. It's a bit more of an in-depth look in what we're expecting with the sheep flock is with the national flock, it was its lowest ever at 64 million in, in 2020. Um, and one thing I'll just make people aware of, uh, Melissa, is that the national most of the figures in our projections are calendar date, everything except for um, the the flock number. But with the flock, um, it this is a 30 drink uh, financial year number. And so while we did probably start to see a rebuild start at the end of last year after last year lambing, that will show up in this year's um, flock, flock sort of the 2021 flock forecast and estimate. But what we are, what we do know is we're coming off the a record low after the the, the drought um, in east eastern Australia um, in 2018, 20, 2019. Um, and, and this year really is expected to be the second year of improved conditions. Very mindful that we, and we are very mindful that it is sort of a, there is two sort of um, regions playing out. There is Western Australia that is still quite dry, um, at that, but nationally it will be the, the second year of, of improved conditions, especially on the East Coast. Um, that's flowing through to increased marking rates. We got feedback from that from the lamb forecasting consultation group um, last year. We're already seeing that. We're already seeing that with the data flowing through. So that's as I talked about in the slide earlier. And we expect a transition from wool meat sheep to meat sheep. We're seeing that in the sheep meat survey. But additionally, uh, with with that wool price coming off, we we do expect to see that um, sort of accelerate the, the years going forward. One of the, the slaughter um, figures for, for lamb. So we do expect, um, like we showed in lamb slaughter to go from 20 million to 20.8 this year. And that increase is, as I said, the marking rates in, um, increase improved last year and expected again this year. So we expect um, that that marking rate is going to allow for higher slaughter, even though we are in a rebuild. The, the higher, um, marking rate is due to the improved conditions and last year was quite a mild winter really so if we get a second mild winter as well that, that'll play into the fact of improved mark, um, marking rates and percentages and, and we have sheep slaughter really uh, remaining stable um, and we'll get to that later. Um, land production is expected to increase because feed prices um, increase feed, feed um, being available through pasture, but also um, the cost of feed grain being so low um, and the high prices are pushing up lamb weights. One thing we are seeing the high prices is there is an incentive to feed um, lambs for longer to reach those heavier weights. So there is a price incentive at the moment. So in the short term, that's what we are seeing and, and expecting the carcass weights to um, increase based on the increased grain and low, low um, cost increased of feed, sorry, low cost of grain uh, and that price incentive. We do expect it to um, plateau over time, largely to meet um, consumer specifications. And we think that'll be feedback from retail, then to processors and then to producers. Um, that is what we do see in the, in the um, longer term. Um, and at that last that, um, point, we do see that, that production um, hitting record levels as we get to the end of the, the forecast period. So national sheep is, is largely unchanged at 6.6 .6 million. We think that there'll be a few weathers turned off with that wool price. Mindful that the wool um, of the wool price, what has happened this year and, and it's uptick a little bit this year. So, so that is a change in the assumption, but we do expect uh, in the rebuild people to use it as an opportunity to turn off unproductive um, unproductive ewes and, and weathers, and we don't expect it to fall too much lower, give, especially given it is at quite low levels, um, only lower than 2011, which was 
following 2010. So we do have that sheep slaughter um, largely stable. This is a similar story to the lamb story where we see the um, carcass weight plateau over time as that price incentive um, dissipates, but also um, as, as that the rebuild matures and also as we sort of uh, get to the end of the forecast period, just what's happening with grain and, and um, the availability of pasture and the question around that. Also, again, meeting, uh, meeting consumer needs is a key thing in that plateauing. I know we've heard, we probably, people in the industry will tell you that they've heard it for a long time, but we do think, and the more we, we sort of talk to processors that they are hearing um, that sort of supply chain discussion where there is definitely a drive for that, um, uh, for the, sort of the cuts to become smaller and, and or, or, or to plateau in size and for that to speed along the supply chain. This is just since 1998, these are just a few slides sort of coming towards the end of it before we get into questions, Melissa, but they, these um, show that the sort of change in the composition from a merino up the flock to, to that real process, that real focus on land production. And we only expect that this um, land production uh, to deviate more from a mutton production as, we see that, uh, and, and, it's, and as is factored in our model, that move to more meat breeds and, and those sort of um, productivity improvements. So this just looks at last year. I, I thought to finish the presentation, and, and we'll take on question. Happy to take on all the questions, Melissa. But um, I wrap with what sort of has happened in the export market for lamb and mutton last year. Um, you'll see this is to year to November, but you'll see really with lamb um, down significantly or down in, in MENA in China, but actually up in, in North America and, and, and stable. Um, mutton was down significantly in China and MENA, uh, and that goes through to some of the COVID issues in MENA and, and the oil price hitting their GDP. Um, and, and in China, there's just been an influx of a lot of proteins into China in, in 2020. Um, one of the key things to take away is that even as the, the value in um, exports may have pegged back a little bit based on those drops in, in volume, one key thing that shows that the demand, export demand is um, in is there overseas, is that the price per kilo for lamb and mutton hasn't dipped. So even as we've seen those, those export volume, uh, export values come off, we haven't seen the price per kilo come off, showing that there is that demand overseas for product. Either there might be COVID restrictions around what they, how much overseas markets can take, but equally, um, if we're not exporting as much because there's supply constraints on the domestic, uh, domestic flock, we are really seeing that that export demand does, is still there. Um, I'm happy to, to throw it over to, to, to the questions, Melissa. I thought, it, I thought the interactive part, I, I'm happy to go through, through any more, any slides, but um, yeah, also happy to take on questions. Thank you very much, Stephen, for going through the data. And I suppose the whole aim of this webinar was not only to have that overview that may, many of you may have already had a look at, but to really delve into the story behind the numbers. So we're going to ask Stephen Chris, CEO of Sheep Producers Australia, to start off with a few questions, get the ball rolling. But we'd love you to participate as well and really help work out how is this information relevant to you. Do a deep dive into what is going to be useful in your business or your organisation. So Stephen, I'll let you kick off, but anyone, if you do have a question, um, you can raise your hand on the, if you go to the bottom of your screen on the right hand side, reactions, you'll be able to find a raise your blue hand and we the can yellow hand. queue up for questions. Alternately, you're welcome to use the chat, but over to Stephen Crisp. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks, Stephen, for joining today and, and going through the, the projections. Uh, I just wanted to quickly point out that um, uh, SBA is also involved in the Land Forecasting Committee, uh, which is part of the process of how these projections are reached. 
is a difficult process um, as far as getting um, survey respondents. Um, and some areas um, such as, especially in Tasmania and Queensland, we've had particularly low um, response rates, which does um, affect your confidence intervals on, on how confident you are in the figures that you're, that you're seeing from the, from the surveys. Uh, MLA works in with um, processes and agents and SPA and <clears throat> basically going through what those uh, organisations, individuals who cover a lot of territory, what they're seeing in sale yards, expected sales from um, producers, what type of sheep they're expecting to sell, what they're, what they're wanting to buy, and also their intentions around um, joining next year, what type of rams they're joining to what type of sheep. And, and trying to get those um, that, that sort of data um, basically validated. Uh, <clears throat> they, they talk to uh, the, the 50 largest um, levy, levy payers, so the larger producers, and nine of the respondents have over 20,000 sheep. So there's something you've got to be careful with because you, you want, um, obviously, the larger operators to, to be involved in what they're thinking, but they may have a different viewpoint from uh, smaller producers and the more family-based producers. And uh, SBA is going to be um, heavily involved in trying to get the uptake of the survey um, uh, results so that we, we get a clear, as clear a picture as to feed into the results because this information is used for, I mean, the processes fact check against what they're, what they're expecting and what they're expecting to sell. It feeds into what, um, what numbers we're expecting to um, be able to produce as a country and what growth markets we target or don't target if we can't supply a market. So there's a fair bit involved in that. So that's just a quick run through of um, SBA's involvement. But Stephen, just to, just to kick off, uh, I suppose we've we've seen uh, you've mentioned that um, the, the figures are updated quarterly, uh, or sorry, every 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 few months, and the the survey results become dated straight straight away. And with with the mass migration of uh, sheep from WA to to the east coast and the effect that that has on live export and those numbers, um, how is how is that managed um, internally with uh, with with MLA and just making sure that um, uh, we don't we don't just run on the on the same assumptions if, if things are obviously changing relatively quickly on a on a state by state um, basis um, and how how you manage that. Thanks for the um, question, Stephen. So I suppose one thing we'd say is is that's why we do update the projections um, three times a year because we are aware that things change. I don't think we saw COVID at the start of twenty twenty being such a big issue. So, so we are aware that some of those um, assumptions will change and, and the figures. So that's why we do uh, update it three times a year. With regards to um, the survey, the survey is one input into the model, but we do use ABS data, ABS data, internal MLA data. Um, we run stuff past the lamb um, forecasting consultation group, but we've got many data points, bomb data points, um, a whole range, every benchmark. So, so we've got a whole lot of figures. So, um, with the sheep, with the sheep survey, we do cross-reference what is coming out of there with what we're getting from, say, the ABS census or the like. So, um, we're not just relying on one data source. So, so with regards to if you had concerns with one data source, we are are cross-referencing that, and everything is sort of weighted. One of the um, so I think that's the question around um, sort of the, the confidence in, in some data points and why we update it. We are always in the process, I suppose the next part is that we are always in the process of constantly improvement, improving the model and, and, and tweaking it for improvement. I think that's um, only best practice. So we are definitely um, strong advocates of that and always in the process of, of tweaking it. Um, one thing that is a limitation is some of the data points um, are available only at a set. So some of the data points are yearly, sheep survey three times a year. Some of the stuff from the ABS is quarterly. And that is something um, regarding the model. We have to keep, there, there has to be obviously the statistical integrity around it. So we have to have the data points. We can validate the numbers and check them with the LFC and SPA, but we don't want, we, it's getting the right balance between 
discretion and, and, and the evidence that we're hearing on the ground and the statistical rigour of the model. So um, I think that's the reviewing it three times a year allows that. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, Melissa, we've got some questions coming in, so I'll throw it open to you to manage the, the question process on the chat or with the hands. Sure. Thank you. So we've got one coming in from Tim and he's asking about when we're doing our sums and our predictions for the business, how do we work out the value that we should put on a lamb? There's a curly question for the two of you. Um, one thing that MLA don't do is we don't um, forecast pricing. Um, we don't forecast pricing because um, we, we don't want to influence producer's decision and um, influence a producer's decision and say a price is X when it ends up being Y. One thing we do do is we give all the supply and demand data for um, a producer to sort of disseminate themselves and to, and to process themselves and see how that will impact what they assume for a value and a price. We, we don't um, do pricing forecasts. Okay, next question. How much of an impact do you think it's going to have from joining you lambs? Um, joining you lambs, we'll get that when that data come, that data starts flowing through in, in the data that we're getting either from the survey or we're getting from ABARES farm data. And it's something we run far through the um, lamb forecasting committee, but we'll get that data when we're starting to see critical mass of that, that will start flowing through into what our national um, flock numbers are. We haven't seen that, but in, when we update that in um, June or, or down the track next year, and we start seeing a critical mass of, of joining ewe lambs, we'll start seeing that having an impact on, on what our predicted flock is. Yeah, Melissa, Steve, the other Stephen here, I suppose um, just anecdotally we're seeing um, because of the increased weights um, with the increase in feed available <clears throat> and, the, and the increasing crossbred um, focus with the, with the pricing set up the way it is, um, we, we are anticipating that that will be significant um, in the next year. There's a lot of people that are considering joining their, their ewe lambs um, that, that traditionally have not done that um, anecdotally, but we until you until you see the data, we won't know the full effect. And I suppose that just to that touches on that thing where we've got to go off the statistic data that we're getting, Melissa. But when we we do test it, um, we we do sort of um, verify it with industry. But we have to have struck that that balance. So, um, yeah. So while most of the work you do is based on you know, the data from the surveys and the numbers that you're seeing coming through, how much prediction and forecasting do you do around, we know we have this many ewe lambs, if different percentages of those were joined, these are the potential results that we could achieve as a country. I'm not sure if you go into, into that area, but I'd be curious to find out if we did, if we could then as an industry determine a minimum number we would need to get to a certain point in our markets. You raise a really good point, Melissa. Um, so actually in part of the um, the team here today, Stu Ripley and myself, in, in one of the things we um, are considering or, 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 or thinking about in, in tweaking model is situational um, case studies or, or scenarios or a range. So having, um, having that ability to factor in what ifs into the model so we've got the model running through the middle but what if we 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 see an increase in um joining new lamps what if we see you know something happen ex in the export market and what happens with the exports and having a sort of a range so we'd still give the absolute number where we see where we forecast the flock but we'd have a range and in those ranges would explain what would what would drive the range up or down so we don't currently um, but we're looking at it, sort of having scenarios and case studies. So at least you've got capacity in the team. That'd be fascinating information to, yep. to look at in a big picture. Okay, we've got another question come in from Ben. It says, when MLA is stating that wool prices are expected to remain low through 2021, 
What do you define as low and what type of modeling or data are you using to make this assumption? So we, we used the ABARES um, modeling on that and they had, when we had our discussions with them in January, sitting below the five-year average um, for 2021 and 2022. Um, I can get back to Ben the exact figure that they had quoted for it, but it was sitting below the five-year average for 21 and 2022. Um, that, and that's the based off the EMI. So again, we don't forecast an input that we can't control. We, we can't control, which would be the EMI. So we use what the a, what ABARES is using and forecasting for the EMI, and that was their forecast, and that's what um, underpins our model. That again. Ma- may and, and, and could very well change in the, um, the June update. But that's what we're going off. Um, again, aware, Ben, that it's sort of ticked up this year and we are seeing that the, the things that we're seeing happen with Crossbred wool. That, that's what we are. We're monitoring that, but in the modelling, it was ABARES. Um, yeah, the ABARES um, forecast. Cool. Um... I can see one. I think uh, Terry sent a message and it's just gone to me. Uh, hasn't gone to Melissa chat, so she can't see it. So I'll ask it on on um, her behalf uh, to Steve Vignold. Uh, as in likely wool versus meat maternal matings, uh, can you tell us how strong the transition from wool sheep to meat sheep will be? So I suppose it comes off the back of that question about the wool pricing. Um, so, yeah, that's the question from Terry. Terry, I can take this one notice because we don't, I can't quote it off the top of my head, but um, it's through tracking. So with that one, it's through tracking the um, AWI, MLA, lambs on hand by breed and breeding ewes on hand um, at composition over time. I can take that offline if, if, if that would help or, or, or I can send it through to yourself, um, Stephen what we're seeing, that, that trend that we are seeing, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I just don't have those figures on me today. Yep, can I, quite happy to send it to me and I'll send it on to um, to Terry. And I think that answers oh Andrew's question as well that's just come through. I, I can get that to you, um, what we're seeing with those, those trends over time. Thank you for offering to follow up at any of those questions and we'll be able to post them below the the information and the recording of the webinar so everyone can go back and reference those as well. Any final questions to come through, please feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat. Anything else, Stephen, that you'd like to add from a Sheep Producers Australia perspective? Um, there is another question there just come through from Andrew Woods. What level of breed breakup do you do you use in the model, such as Merino, Composites, various British breeds? Shedding, so I suppose it's not the trend. It's what um, what assumptions are you making um, at the time of the of the projections? So it's the historical data, and then what we have, and then the trend. It, it, revol- it involves those trends, sort of um, the regression flowing forward of, of what we're seeing in those historical trends as a percentage of the composition. Yeah. No worries. Fabulous. Anything to finish up, Stephen Crisp? Uh, no, I think um, there's a few surprising things in the in the data, and I suppose the processors will be will be um, very happy if if um, the projections come to fruition. Um, the mutton uh, volumes last year were well well down, and I think that last graph that um, that Stephen put up with the export numbers and the and the low mutton numbers, which I think was more volume based than anything else. Um, China has been sucking in um, sheep and it was probably very fortunate that the drought has finally um, come to an end in, in most parts of the of the country because uh, you're losing that number of ewes into into hot pots and uh, in uh, around the around the world, but the, the, the amount of uh, protein that China has been taking in, um, that's um, it was doing um, coming to a point of critical concern for our flock. So if we are able to return to a, a leveling out of the of the sheep slaughter numbers, and we are able to uh, increase the lamb lamb slaughter again, then that will be a great relief to the industry and the, and the infrastructure that surrounds it. Um, but other than that, um, if there's unless anyone's got any more questions, um, I'm quite quite happy to, to leave it at that. 
The other thing which I think may be worth mentioning is there's a project called the Sheep Supply Project that Sheep Producers Australia is uh, working on with some other stakeholders at the moment. It does tie in to this industry projections. So, Stephen, I wondered if it, you'd like to comment a little bit on that and how it does tie in and link here. Um, good question. Um, I suppose it's one of the many... Pro we, we the projections I touch point it's like the sheep survey the supply chain project they all link in and provide either verification um a consultation actual data inputs into the model um it, so so it's sort of an avenue of improving i would suggest the the the, the robustness of the model and, and the robustness of our figures i'm not sure if you if if you want to add to that, Melissa, uh, I'll probably I'll probably um, add add to it. I mean, the sheep supply project itself um, it's it's been absolutely absolutely concerning about our, our level of infrastructure and the, the growing trends from from drought to drought or from recovery of a sheep rebuild um, through the peaks and troughs. What's been consistent is each trough's been consistently lower and each peak has been consistently lower over the past few decades. And it's got to a point where we want to be able to maintain our, our share of our world of our world markets because uh, money is there, but the continuing um, downtrend has, has seen the sheep producers moving moving out of sheep into other areas. Now, whether that's due to a change in technology or um, just um, the, the amount of labour involved, the ageing farmer um, workforce and, the, and, and how, how uh, sheep are perceived. So the sheep supply project is actually going through the social sciences as well as how we re rebuild a flock and just really drilling into the, um, into the reasons behind the flock to find. Some reasons are obvious, but some are less obvious and we can't go on uh, guessing. We have to actually know exactly um, what's in our producers' heads and what we can change if we're going to change a trend, not just not just rely on the change in seasons and hope and hope that the the, the peaks in the future are higher than the peaks in the in the past. Um, Chris Myron says on the call has he, I think he will regularly tell you that we want to maintain our 30 plus percent of the world sheep export market. Um, we need to have a flock of around um, between 70 and 75 million and that that actually does take a reverse in the trend and we need to see this this flock rebuild happen to the extent and a little bit further than what um, the figures are suggesting today if we're going to keep our numbers of processes and and other avenues of of sale of our product um, then that's that's the sort of level we need to have and there's definitely the world demand as the figures of, of showing the money's there and our consumption rates um, in Australia are low, which has mostly been a figure, a factor of the of the price of, of the product, um, not an unwillingness to to consume the product. So we have high prices; uh, they can continue, but we need to we need to rebuild the flock, which is what the supply um, project is all about: is just drilling into the exact reasons, so that we're not we're not guessing. We we know, and we can inform our policy accordingly. So, for anyone interested in finding out more about the sheep supply project. We are just putting together a update on that that will be released in the March update. So keep an eye on your inboxes over the next week uh, for more information on the sheep supply project. And one thing we um, uh, would be of interest I'll just uh, raise with you guys is we're soon to be releasing um, our Agri Benchmark um, Global Comparison um, Report should be released shortly. Um, that'll be an interest and in it it really compares um, the profitability of, of farms across 21 countries, um, what the breakup is of the farm um, receipts, it looks at productivity, it looks at um, a whole range of things and we will be releasing that uh, early April, I believe. And it's a good, interesting read and it, and it compares Australia's long-term profitability, short-term profitability of sheep operations across across the world, with those across the world. Fabulous. Looking forward to having a read. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today, especially to our speakers for sharing their information. Stephen Bignall of MLA, thank you for presenting that data, and Stephen Crisps from SPA. If you'd like any further information, don't forget to jump on the Sheep Producers Australia website 
Um, and we're always open to feedback on what other information you'd like us to share with you. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day.